Um, so the next thing on the list, let's see here. Since we're talking about aged meat, I think now would be an appropriate transition into our cordyceps talk. Um, so if you guys have seen Last of Us, you'll know that there's lots of fungi and they basically, I'll show you some cool pictures of, of what cordyceps do. So first of all, uh, if you're wondering what it is, it's a really cool orange fungus, um, as depicted here. Is my thing, it's not even centered. What the heck? I'm sorry. Hang on. There we go. Let's, my bad. I didn't even realize. Okay. Um... It looks kind of like um, Cheetos, except it's not. Battle Toast, you're going to be like, I dried this meat myself, and people will be like, wow. And then in my head, I'm like, I also have no quality control. <laughs> Ew. Homemade doesn't always mean better. It often means eat at your own risk. Yeah, no. Definitely, if you're going to do the aged beef thing, you should read books and stuff and maybe talk to your butcher about the best way to do it safely because I don't want you to die from meat poisoning. Um, we're used to things being off center here. <laughs> Jesus. Uh, but yeah, so um, cordyceps are no, there's six over 600 known species of different types of cordyceps. There's a whole variety of them and they're best known for their ability to parasitize insects and leave these really beautiful dead insect sculptures that people take pictures of because they're fucked up. Uh, look at this. So, for example, most people think of this, um, think of the insects as typically being ants. Um, but they can also parasitize other insects as well. Can I just, is there like a way to just do an arrow key? I want like the full zoomed in version of the picture. How do I do that? I'm a boomer. How do I, how do I make the pictures bigger and then click and go that way? Can we do that? I don't think so. Um, so basically what you see here, this is a dead ant. And sticking out of the ant is the fruiting body of the cordyceps. And at the tip of the cordyceps fruiting body is um, where all the little spores are. And over time, they dry and harden. And then the spores just kind of, if there's a disturbance or wind, the spores just go poof. And they blow around and they go to another animal. They contaminate the soil. Um, it's and there's like, there's thousands, uh, actually hundreds of thousands of spores that are produced. Look at this. This is a spider. I don't like spiders, but I'm going to look at it really closely. Um, you can see all of the beautiful little fruiting bodies just coming out of this dead insect. Um, over here, we have what looks to be a small carcass. Um, over here, we have somebody trying very stupidly to stick cordyceps into a jar. Like, I don't know why you would do that. Um, because again, so if you guys weren't here earlier, I briefly mentioned that people like to use cordyceps as a immunomodulatory and anti-cancer natural treatments. Um, it has been explored. Um, it is not FDA approved, and there is very little research done into what kinds of anti-cancer properties cordyceps have, although from the papers I read, it seems that cordyceps, um, I guess the X, I don't even know, like the extract, uh, let's see here. I think I have the page somewhere. Drug resistance, zombieing, souped up. Oh, anti-tumor activity. Okay. So, um, cordyceps as an herbal drug. This was published back in the mid 2000s, I think. So it, it's not a really hot topic. Um, but, um, okay. So cordyceps have been used um, historically as an herbal drug in Chinese pharmacy and um, medicine. And um, I guess like the kind of history of cordyceps in, in in Chinese medicine is that uh, it can replenish the kidney, soothe the lung, which is interesting because when you think of fun fungus and spores, most of those things irritate the lungs and cause really horrible diseases. Um, but they think it could also stop bleeding and eliminate phlegm, blah, 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 blah. So then we go down to the use as an anti-tumor drug. 
Okay, it talks about how bad cancer is, woohoo. Um, studies have shown that cordyceps have anti-tumor activity in various cancers through several pathways, although they aren't really specific about what these pathways are. They say, actually, they do say that the pathway is through triggering apoptosis through this protein called BAX. Um, and it down-regulates another protein called BCL2, which is an anti-apoptotic protein. So if you shut down BCL2 and you increase Bax, then you get cell death. And somehow, cordyceps does this very specifically in tumor cells and not normal healthy cells. Um, but I saw no explanation as to why that was, which is you know, one of the first things you do before you give a, a drug to someone um, specifically for like treating a cellular disease like cancer is you want to make sure it doesn't kill their normal cells. Um, obviously, chemotherapy does, um, and radiation, so you do have like some risks. But um, anyways, so this, um, you can use these um, fungus uh, to kill cancer cells. Um, okay. Um, and other various things that we're not going to get into. Um, Oh, hello, where's me super suit? Hang on a second, how are you? Welcome in. I have just been ignoring people. Um, I wonder if you can get high from that fungi. Can you get high from cordyceps? I actually don't know, so I'm gonna Google it, all right? Can you get high from cordyceps? Can you overdose? Overdose has not been reported, however, there are concerns about cordyceps potential to contain toxins. Long-term human trials on cordyceps have not been completed to date, so researchers are not confident in its long-term use. There's your answer. The first thing on Google. Um, I'll be honest, I was mostly just looking at uh, what cordyceps does to insects and not necessarily what you can use it as um, in terms of a drug. Um, I don't think it has any sort of uh, properties that you know, make you high. Um, people say it might keep you awake. It's an adaptogen that is a natural energizer, but this is all on like public forums, so I don't actually know. Uh, here's a paper that was published in a NCBI. Um, the title is Cordyceps Militaris Improves Tolerance to High Intensity Exercise After Acute and Chronic Supplementation. All right, so they made a mushroom blend containing cordyceps militaris, which is a species of cordyceps, or, yeah. Um, and then they did a human, um, a human study, and they were looking at uh, oxygen consumption, time to exhaustion, and ventilary threshold. I don't know how these things are measured because I don't care about exercise. I could give two Fs about exercise, but if you care about exercise and exercising better, maybe you understand what these things are. Um, so then they gave the supplements with the cordyceps and their results, which are down here, revealed significant improvements in the uh, time to exhaustion. Does that mean that it got less? People were less exhausted? Um, and then MR, what was MR? MR is a mushroom blend, okay. What's PL? Maltodextrin, why would you call maltodextrin PL? What does that even, okay, that doesn't make sense. So their conclusion is that um, acute supplementation, so I suppose just taking cordyceps briefly for that short amount of time, uh, may improve tolerance to high intensity exercise. Um, but honestly, take that with a grain of salt. Um, but yeah, so anyways, that's what people use it for in the medicine world, I suppose. Um, do you want zombies? Because that's how you get zombies. Wait, oh, what we were, let's see, this? Oops, not that. Look at this, this looks really cool. Here you can see all the fruiting bodies coming out of this delicious caterpillar. And here you can see more fruiting bodies coming out. Um, I want to find some bigger pictures. It's really, it's actually really horrific. And if you have seen the, the new show Last of Us, you'll know that um, they actually get the imagery of Cordyceps fruiting bodies really accurate. Like, look at that. That looks just like on the show. 
which is nice. I appreciate that. Um, did you know the alphabet says P comes before T? PT? However, I have discovered in life that the first, that first you drink the tea and then you go pee. Oh my God. Oh my God, really? <laughs> nice. Um, Pre-workout for the gym. Yeah, just snort some cordyceps. Look at that. It looks like pre-workout too. It looks like shredded per dried persimmons. Um, Calf, did you ever see the movie Annihilation? Annihilation. No, I have not seen that movie. Is it good? Is it about zombies? Is it about annihilating things? Um, so if you guys like Cheetos, you might like Cordyceps because they look like Cheetos. Look at that. Look at these gigantic, delicious, plump, yummy fruiting bodies. They look so good, like cheese puffs. Um, kind of reminds me of that horror movie, Splinter. What is that about? You guys have all these weird movies you watch. I never understand. How do they get them to grow in a bed like that? Well, you know, I'm assuming they plant them very specifically. Well, actually, what you can do is if you restrict the, the root system of, uh, of a mushroom, for example, it's not going to be able to spread anywhere, and so you can cluster it in pretty tightly in a nice, like, grow bed. Or, you, you know, like those, like, little, those little beds that people make for their vegetables? I'm pretty sure they grow these mushrooms in a similar way. Um... Okay, I had a whole script. What was I, let's see. Okay, so one of the, the things that's really interesting about fungi is that they're actually very similarly related to um, human mammalian cells. Um, and they're also um, structurally similar to mammalian cells, except one of the big differences, and this is why we have antifungal um, drugs that don't harm our own mammalian cells, is that, um, a, fun a fungus has like the cell wall and it is typically made out of, let's see, you guys can see my goddamn notes. It's not centered again. Hang on, I gotta center it. There we go, everything's great now. Um, but anyways, uh, a fungus has a cell wall and an, a mammalian cell only has a membrane that's made out of cholesterol. Um, a fungus also has a membrane, that little yellow thing that's made out of cholesterol, but it is surrounded by um, a cell wall. And the cell wall is made out of chitin and other things like glucan and other glycoproteins that mammalian cells don't have. And so you can use these specific drugs um, and, uh, that I will show you right here. Um, one is called amphotericin B and one is called flucytosine. And these two antifungal drugs are commonly used to treat, you guessed it, fungal brain infections in humans because humans can get fungus in, in the brain, which is really horrific. Um, and so, let's see, I think I had a little mechanism of action thing going on here. Let's see, is this, is this the link? Actually, is this the link? Medical treat now. Let's look, let's look here. Ah, yeah. So this is a really shitty picture, and you probably can't see it that well. Here we go. So polyenes, which is what amphotericin B is, that's the class of drug that it is. Um, basically, it kind of rips open and puts pores into the um, cell membrane of the... Uh, um, of the fungus. Now, I will be honest, I don't actually know um, what the difference is in terms of how it affects a fungal cell membrane versus the human cell membrane because they're so similar. Um, and then uh, it might just actually affect the cell wall, which is the chitin component. And then we have the fluorocytosine, which is the other antifungal drug that was mentioned. And that one directly disrupts the replication of DNA and RNA inside of the fungus. Um, there's another type of antifungal drugs called um, azoles, and they will kind of destroy the, the sterile 
biosynthesis sterols are like, for example, cholesterol is a sterile, but there's other sterols that are specific to fungi and the azole kind of blocks the production of that. Um, and those are like the three main classes of drugs. I know there's a fourth one and I forget what it is because it's not FDA approved. These three are the three FDA approved classes of drugs to treat fungal diseases. Now, the fun thing is, is that they're actually cases of drug resistance and drug resistance to fungal drugs is increasing every year. And there's this really horrible story about, for example, this woman, a case study, she had um, symptoms that were like a flu. She came into the hospital. Turns out she had an aspergillus uh, infection, which is a fungus um, depicted here. This is a fake color. Aspergillus doesn't actually look all pink and pretty like that. Um, aspergillus is a fungus that is typically spread through its spores and it's inhaled into the lungs, um, which probably explains why she had like flu-like symptoms. She was only 38 and she wasn't immunocompromised. Um, and so they saw these lesions in her lungs, um, which I'll show you some pictures of. And they were trying to treat her with known antifungal drugs, the three which I just showed you. Um, and unfortunately, 16 days after she was admitted into the ICU, she passed away, um, which is really tragic. Um, so yeah, basically none of the antifungal drugs worked um, and the strain of, of aspergillus that she had was resistant. Um, so in 2019, the US Center for Disease Control estimated that 18 superbugs, both drug-resistant fungi and bacteria, because both of those are known problems, cause at least 2.8 million drug-resistant infections every year in the United States. That's 2.8 million. That's a lot of people and a lot of drug-resistant bugs. Um, unfortunately, this results in 35,000 deaths, probably more or less. Um, some of the, the really bad drug-resistant fungi are from the candida species, uh, different candida species. Um, and then, let's see. Um, there was, where was the thing where, oh yeah, here we go. The number of fungal infections reported as the cause of death steadily increased in the U.S. between 2013 and 2018, so five years, from 4,000 to 5,000. So it's, it's not in extremely fast, but it is quite fast. And one of the reasons why this could be happening is because um, farmers are using a lot more antifungals in the treatment of their crops. Um, and also there is a lot more use of antifungals and for treating infections. And while this is great and all, it increases the chances that you're selecting for those very resistant fungi that have develop have acquired mutations over time that make them resistant to these like azoles and um, the fluorocytosine or whatever um, and so those um, resistant variants will grow out and they'll be selected for while all the other non-resistant fungi will be killed off and so you'll be left with like a population of extremely resistant fungi um, and and that's where this problem comes from um, okay so that's, that's for drug resistance. Um, let's see, what did I want to say? Oh, how antifungals work. Oh, this is just a really beautiful image of what uh, fungi look like under the microscope. You can see the little like um, spores that form around the fruiting body. It looks like a little flower. It's really pretty. I just wanted to show you that. And then my favorite thing in the whole world is mind control. And I'm going to show you this fun video about mind control. Wow. Hi, Mick Scruff. Hello to you. I hope you're doing well. Wait, is this, this, oh, this video is like not even in, oops, my bad. My bad. Um, fun guy or fungi? I don't know. I like to call it both things. I think it's fungi, but you could call it fungi if you want to. I'm not gonna, you, yeah, you could call it whatever you want. Mick Scruff, how are you doing? Welcome, welcome to the stream. Hang on. Why is my, why, why is this, what is this? Why is it so small? 
That's what she said. Okay. Fungina. Fungina. <laughs> All right. We are talking about um, parasitizing fungi, specifically cordyceps, which star on the new HBO hit, The Last of Us. In that show, uh, zombies or infected people have this fungi living inside of them and controlling their brains. And the inspiration for this show comes from uh, this very lovely example that happens in nature where cordyceps take over the brain of these little ants. They also take over the brains of other insects. Now, I will have you guys know that in the literature thus far, I haven't seen an example of a fungus that parasitizes mammals. We are mammals. That is why that's important. Um, so whatever kind of adaptation fungi would need to like cross over from like being able to parasitize and control the mind of an insect to controlling the mind of a human, that's a huge leap. And basically most people in the science field think that it is very unlikely that that could happen. I am of the mindset that maybe in a thousand years something like that could happen, but hopefully not soon. Um, it, it is very unlikely, so don't, don't like stay up at night freaking out over fungi. You should worry if you're immunocompromised, and I will show you guys some of the fun things that happens to human brains in humans that are immunocompromised, actually normal healthy humans as well. Um, there's this really horrible condition that can happen to some people. Um, it's called an asp aspir aspiroloma, aspergiloma. <laughs> Oh my God, I can't say it. Uh, let me just show you a, a real quick picture. Um, okay, so this is brain tissue and those little circles right there, um, those are yeast. You guys can see this. Um, those are like, or the fungus. Um, in this case, it's Cryptococcus neoformans, which is a type of fungus. Um, fungus and yeast are the same. And it causes cryptococcal meningitis, um, typically in people who are immunocompromised. Um, so if you're healthy and you don't, you're not like taking immunosuppressants, and you're not like, you don't have some other underlying condition, then you shouldn't get this. Although there are a few cases of people getting uh, cryptococcal meningitis. Basically, what that looks like in the brain, um, it forms something called a brain aspergilloma, um, and you can see in this very tiny little illustration. Um, there is like this little circle, this little patch in the brain denoted by the red arrow. And that is this mass of fungal tentacles that are like basically making this little glob of tissue um, and killing the cells. And it makes like this disgusting mass in the brain. It also happens in the lung. This is like a CT scan, I think, or MRI of a, of a lung. You could see this mass there as well. And then this, I think, is a lung. I, I can't even tell. It's so messed up. Actually, if you want to see some really cool aspergilloma pictures, which you probably didn't ask for. So, oh, hello. We have a new person. Hang on. I got to welcome the new person before they freak out and run away. Um, parasitic, yes. Oh, hello. Oh, clickers. Hello, Trainer Joey. Welcome in. Um, Clickers are, are terrifying, basically. Yeah, if you guys watch this show, you'll see them in, in episode two of The Last of Us. They're, they're horrific. Um, I have a hard time believing that any fungi could make its, its host move that quickly um, because at least in the known cases in insects, um, usually the behavior is very... Uh, I mean, it can be sporadic, but they don't usually cause the insect to go and like kill or bite some other insect. Normally it create, uses the insect as like a host to grow in and then it grows out of it, makes its little fruiting bodies and then um, through like wind or disturbances, the spores are just naturally um, contaminated in the surrounding area and other insects in that area pick up the spores and get it that way. But you know, nothing is impossible I suppose. So aspergilloma, uh, I'm probably saying this wrong. Here's a diagram. Basically, it's a mass that's really small. Let me find a bigger picture. Ooh. 
oh God, this is an example of chronic pulmonary aspergillosis. This is caused by a fungus, guys. Oh my God, it looks like aged meat. <laughs> it looks like aged beef. <laughs> oh my God, it's so horrible. Um, you can see all that necrotic tissue there. Unfortunately, this person probably died. Um, here's, a, here's the classic definition of it. Aspergilloma, a fungus ball. It's a clump of mold which exists in the body cavity, typically in the lungs because that's where you're inhaling the spores, but also it can travel into the brain. Um, a study was recently done where they found that, um, I think it was, what species was it? Um, Cryptococcus can cross the blood-brain barrier which is scary AF, the blood-brain barrier, it basically, it protects your brain from the rest of your body and from potential pathogens. Um, it doesn't allow certain things of a specific size um, to go through. Viruses can cross the blood-brain barrier, but most bacteria shouldn't be able to, um, but they can sometimes. Um, and one of the ways that you can get infections in the brain is actually through um, your cribriform plate, which is this plate of bone um, inside of your nose. And it has, basically, it has these holes in it that allow the nerves that um, travel into your nose and into your olfactory bulb and go back into your brain. It travels through the holes in this in this bony structure. And any kind of, like for example, um, Nigeria falri, which is a type of amoeba that is known to infect brain tissue, it actually uses the cribriform plate as this little transport system into the brain. So that's really scary. Um, so yeah, that can happen. Um, okay, where was my tab? Oh my God. Let me go through all my tabs real fast. Uh, we're done talking about that. We're done talking about, no. Um, oh yeah, aspergilloma, right. Let's look, look at some more fun pictures of what this looks like. And oh, here's a mass. Um, I don't actually know what tissue this is. It's so dead looking. Um, but you can see this, this disgusting fungal ball right there and all of the dying cells around it. It's horrific. Oh, here's another great image. You can literally see the fungus like just growing in clumps. Um, yeah. Oh man, there's some pictures of people extracting it out of fresh tissue. I'm not gonna show you that close up. If you guys want to look at this more um, for shits and giggles, just type this word in. Ants get it, mantises get it. It's a parasite that gets into your brain and lives and controls you. If you are an insect, unless you live in the world created by Last of Us. Um, because fortunately, we have a pretty good immune system that protects us from most of these, um, well, at least from cordyceps. I think also the cordyceps, so the way that they actually cause this mind control is quite fascinating. Um, it's not entirely known how it happens, but on, in this paper over here, where I recently just pulled it up and now it's gone, let's see. In this paper, um, that was, I think this research paper came out, so this is just an article talking about the research paper, but this um, article came out in 2019. Um, this is just an example of an ant that has been covered in cordyceps and is dead. Um, but let's see, there was, there's this research group at Penn State University that has been studying like what is the mechanism of um, this cordyceps. It's called Ophiocordyceps unilateralis. That's the specific species that infects carpenter ants. Um, and they were looking for the mechanism as to like how this fungi goes into the brain of these ants and causes them to die. Um, and to do all the weird things, like the behavioral things that um, happens to these ants before they die. Um, I think before I, sh I tell you what they found, I should probably show you the rest of this video so you kind of get a um, bird's eye view of the condition. This is a lovely, here, let me turn my, this is a very dramatic video.
30,000 spores per second, guys. That's a lot of spores. Can you guys hear? Oh, that's really loud. Spores! Oh, look. This is some great footage of an ant. Aw. Oh, no. The fungi actually directly stick to the roots or, or muscles. This filming is epic. Roofied. Sorry. Graham. Hello, Graham. Oh man, this is the part I love. Death grip. Death bite, sorry, that's better. This is a time lapse. It doesn't grow that quickly. But it's just like in The Last of Us, isn't it? How can I expedite the process of mushrooms taking over the world? Pay for faster shipping. Missing more spores, infecting more ants, infecting more ants. Oh man, look at all those dead ants. It's so beautiful. That's cool. Stay out of jungles. Stay inside. Yeah, stay inside. Don't go outside ever again. Wow, that was so cool. OK, so that was uh, the, um, what was that called? Hang on. Where's the, where's the fancy name? I lost it. Oh, Ophiocordyceps unilateralis. And it's infectious, in, infection, <laughs> infectation. It's infection of uh, the carpenter ants. Um, Lovely Lou would like to expedite the process of mushrooms taking over the world. All right. Um, that's nice. Um, she's gone feral. That's what, yes, the ant went feral. Don't mess with mushrooms. Um, so how does this happen? How did we get here? How do mushrooms take control of ants? Well, that's a great question. Um, so um, basically this, this research group was looking specifically at the, the jaw muscle, basically, the mandibular muscle of these ants after they get infected with the fungal spores. Because if you'll remember in that video, 
Um, one of the first things that happens, I mean, well, one of the first things that happens is that the, the ant travels to a place where there's specific light and humidity. Um, however, in this paper, they don't necessarily talk about that. They talk about that, that death bite um, that happens. Um, because that, if you think about it, that's really crazy. The, the ant is not consenting to doing this death bite where it's basically clamping down on some like stable location to kind of hold itself there while it slowly dies. So how does this happen? How do, what controls its muscles, right? Um, well, oh my God, we got a follower. Oh, trainer Joey, thank you so much for that. I appreciate you, welcome. Um, mushrooms were here first, yes. So how does this happen? Okay, so this um, research group used some really fancy microscopy. Um, I think they use, they use scanning electron microscopy, which basically allows you to look um, at like the nanometer scale um, at like different cells and cell structures um, to see the interaction between the, the fungus and the muscle cells inside of the jaw of an ant, which is, if you think about it, that's tiny. So this image that I have right here is um, a result of that. And let me just look at the key because I actually don't know what all the arrows are. The figure is called Invasion of Mandibular Muscle Space by Ophiocordyceps Kim, oh, they're looking at a different type of cordyceps called Kim Flamengiae. Evidence for muscle over contraction. Infected mandibular muscle displays unique characteristics. Okay, blah, blah, blah. Um, so in, in panel A, that is uh, uninfected controls. Okay, so this is an uninfected um, muscle tissue. I'm, I don't know what all of this T and M are, so let me see here. Motor neurons and trace tracheoles. Okay, so M is for motor neuron. MN is motor neuron, and then T is tracheal, uh, which I think is this specific, I forgot what tracheals are in insects. Um, is that how they get oxygen into their bodies, I think? Tracheals. Um, I'm an immunologist, not an, an entomologist. Tracheals are fine tubes that make up part of the respiratory system of insects. Air enters the insect's body through the spiracle and then enters the trachea. The tracheals end within the body cells. So yes, that's how they get oxygen to all of their tissues and cells. Okay, so going back to this image. Um, wow, I thought a tracheal would look like a hole, but it's actually kind of a small, like, kind of, I don't know, a small vessel. Um, and then the motor neurons are much thicker. Okay, so again, keep in mind, panel A here is normal. Now it's panel B. Uh, fungal cells completely invade the intermuscle space and are in close contact with individual muscle cells. Infected muscle cells demonstrate a uni unique morphology where the Z lines appear to be swollen and sarcomeres shortened, giving the regular striations a very pronounced appearance. Sarcomeres are just, uh, they're part of the muscle cell because muscle cells have to contract and expand and sarcomeres, I forget exactly, they're like the ring structure that is seen here. Um, so F, I think, so F is the fungus. So now you can see that the muscle cells, I believe they're much more contracted here and that's why you see the ridging happening. And then you see the fungal spores kind of growing all around um, and kind of forming this like little lattice. They're basically those little like those little pill shaped like sausage shaped things. That's the fungus. And it's just interweaving with the muscle tissue. All right. Now let's see. It looks like they zoomed in even closer to try to see what that fungus was doing down in C. But let's just check. C, as a result of extensive damage to the sarcolemma, probably a muscle cell part, individual myofibrils underneath the membrane are exposed in infected muscle. Areas of sarcomere shortening um, are evident. Okay. They don't say what the... Oh, the arrows are pointing to swollen, unexposed regions of muscle. Okay. So in C... 
Um, you see the big like red arrows. Um, you can see it looks like it's been ripped open, and you see the. I think those are the sarcomeres. We could just look at a diagram of uh, inst insect muscle tissue. Diagram of insect, because I actually <laughs> I don't know what a <laughs> all of these um, terms are. Um, oh, here we go. Does it say sarcoplasmic reticulum? Oh. Okay. The sarcomere. Okay, so the sarcomere is that like netting that you kind of see back in the scanning electron microscopy image. So you, do you see this kind of like, it looks like a wicker basket. Um, that's the exposed muscle because of the fungal infection. Um, and then they zoomed in even closer in D to see what was um, what the fungi was kind of um, doing to each individual sarcomere because they were talking about like these weird vesicles that the fungus makes and they don't know what is inside the vesicle. A vesicle is just kind of like a little droplet containing some sort of effector molecule, which could be like a toxin or something. Um, when you figure out if fungi can make zombies, let me know so I, I'll... So I'll know if I need more ammo. I gotta go watch a movie. Oh, all right, next scruff. I don't know. I don't know if anyone's ever gonna know the answer to that. That was a clickbait title. Sorry. Um, <laughs> I'm just interested in what they do currently to to uh, insects. So in D, um, okay, yeah, that's just the the damaged part of the muscle tissue. Okay, and then what do what do they look at in T? They're talking about those Z lines, which again, I don't know what a Z line is. The arrows are pointing to damage. I really, I honestly don't know what I'm looking at here. Um, I don't look at microscopic pictures of insects all day, but um, okay, let's, there's one more image that was more interesting. Ah, here. Okay, here in B, you can see all of the really cool fungal scores, uh, fungal, um, spores and you can see they have like this little ring around them um, that is like kind of their like budding circle and that's where they will like divide and make new fungal spores what's the powerhouse of the cell mitochondria mitochondria are really cool as well oh and then a i think a is where they're showing evidence of the fungus actually latching on to muscle cells inside of the ant's jaw Hang on, so A in, oh wait, no, that's, oh, I'm sorry. Uh, in A, those are control ants. Um, there's numerous motor neurons and neuromuscular junctions are evident, blah, blah, blah. Okay, that's normal, sorry. Uh, <laughs> in B, motor neurons and neuromuscular junctions um, depicted by the arrowheads in infected mandibular muscle are maintained. Okay, so I guess they were saying like, you can see that the neuromuscular junctions are still attached to the muscle, like in the control um, ants in A, so I guess they're not damaging that. Okay. Um, and then in C, uh, those are control ants, and then in D, those are infected ants. Nervous tissue, okay, I actually don't know, but apparently they labeled the mitochondria, so you were just asking about the mitochondria. The M depicts the mitochondria. So we'll zoom in because it's super tiny, as mitochondria are. This is a, a whole muscle cell here, and then the this little like darkish vacuole, that is the mitochondria. Tiny. I have no idea how they can tell that's a mitochondria. Um, mitochondria do look very distinct within a cell. They have a lot of these like little kind of like um, folds inside of them. Um, what else did they look at? Oh, damage to the sarcolemma is consequence of fungal infection and not specifically associated with the death grip. Okay, so I don't really know what this image is showing, but it is really cool. You see, again, the muscle fibers with all of the fungi just growing around it, which I just really enjoy looking at because it looks like, it honestly looks like um, tree branches with like really thick vines growing around it. Um... Oops. Let's see. Oh, what's this? We've got some tips going on. 
Okay. I, whoa, look at this nodule right here. Let's see what this is. Um, in some instances, physical invasion of muscle cells by fungal hyphae um, is evident. In the boxed regions, are, um, which are shown at higher magnification in B and C, um, you can see the fungal hyphae. Interconnected networks of fungal cells um, in A are able to access host muscle via direct insertion of one fungal cell from the network. Whoa, In insertion? Where's the ins, oh my God, okay. So do you see, okay, in this small box here, it looks like the tip of the, the hyphae, the fungal hyphae, is like going inside of the muscle cell. So let's look over here and see where they zoomed in, right? I'll zoom in too so you can see what I'm talking about. You can see the literal hyphae like burrowing, burrowing into um, this, the bigger muscle cell. And you can see like a hole where all of the fibers are ripped open. Just the tip. Just the tip. So is there a scan? Oh, um, this is like, are, what, what do you mean a scan? This is uh, scanning electron microscopy images. So like super high resolution microscopy. Uh, also, thank you for the hydrate. I actually really do need some water because my mouth is dry. So uh, give me one second. Um, so yeah, I think in B here, you can also see another hyphae branching off and burrowing, burrowing, I can't say this word, it's burrowing right into that more rough looking bark like muscle cell. It looks like bark. So I guess you can literally think of um, cordyceps as like a puppeteer quite realistically where they're like literally sticking their little hyphae into the muscle cells of an ant and then controlling the contraction of the muscle cell, which is insane. That's so cool. And this is like, direct visual evidence of that. This is freaking cool, okay. Oh, and then this is something very interesting. So they saw that numerous fungal cells possess extracellular vesicle-like particles um, shown in these arrows, which I'll open in a bigger window. Um, and they're attached to the cell bodies. In most cases, these vesicles appear in small clusters and sometimes they're in large clusters. Um, so they were all like, there are some weird things here. I actually don't know if they have a control panel. I don't think this is a control. This looks like a fungal infected um, ant, but I'm sure they didn't see any, I didn't see any vesicles, these little balls in the control ants from earlier. So you see these little like boba pearl things stuck to the hyphae of the fungi that are um, again, inside of this ant, inside of its jaw muscle. They zoom in a little bit and they're like, what the fuck are these vesicles? What the fuck are these vesicles? Like they look like little grapes. Um, and then they also, they're showing, this is a more zoomed out image now. You can see the tiny little white pearls and where they are oriented on the tips of the hyphae. Um, and they go on to speculate that, okay, maybe these um, vesicles contain the neurotoxins or whatever that are, or like some sort of molecule that maybe modulates the ant's innate immune system or some other part of the ant's bodily functions. Um, and so what this group is doing now is they're trying to isolate these vesicles from these infected ants. So they wanna take these balls out and then do some chemical tests on them and see what the fuck these balls are. Yeah. Yeah, the matcha powder was very dry burning beard. It really was. It's the necromancer of the mushrooms. It's so cool. It is really cool. Um, yeah, let's see. I think that's all. They have a discussion. If anybody wants to read this paper, it's actually pretty straightforward. You might have to Google things like I did, like what the fuck is a sar sarcomere? <laughs> But if you want to read it, I'm putting the, the link into the chat and you can take a look um, whenever. 
uh, to the to the screen. You guys behave so well. That's nice. What does WN mean? Hey, gear. Um, what screen am I supposed? To? Oops. <laughs> Where am I? Uh, where's my science stream share? Okay. Let me see what what was next on my on my agenda here. Oh yeah, this is such a cool picture. I don't know if this is real or not. Um, the source that I got it from said it was a real photograph. I just can't believe it. Uh, this is the beautiful fruiting bodies growing out of a of a decimated, desiccated ant, which is really fun. Um, I have a link here for some reason. I don't know what what was at this link. Open the link. Oh, this was just more pictures of cordyceps. Okay. This is actually pictures of ants dying, which is really fun, but anyhow. Um, so there's actually another example of a parasitic fungi in nature, and it infects cicadas. Cicadas? Cicadas? I don't know. There's... Here. She's going to give us a quick little explanation of zombifying fungus in the cicada. Cicada? I, I don't know. These are really cool. So these are not the annual cicadas, but the ones that awake every year. But they're the perennial cicadas, which awake every 17 years. Um, so they're like, they're like underground a lot of time, which I would assume would give them ample... Um, ample time and potentially make them more vulnerable to fungal infection. But anyways, she's going to quickly, it's a very short video, but uh, she's going to talk about it real fast. Did you guys notice that she's wearing a cicada necklace? She is a hardcore nerd. I love this lady. So anyways, the fungus gnaws away at the genitals. Let's continue. On the bright side, at least we aren't getting zombified and having our genitals replaced with, with parasitic fungus. Okay, let's, sorry, I just had to.
This is this is just so cool. And I'm going to show you guys some fun pictures of like the these cicadas in a second. Fantastic. That was such a moving and inspirational film. Wow, I loved that. Wait, is this? Oh my God, Chaotic Good Mage. Hello there, how are you? When I asked for a fun guy to take control, this is not what I meant. <laughs> oh, you're, you're, you're funny. Um, yeah, so basically the cicada, um, wow, wait a second, was I, were you guys not even seeing the whole picture? Uh-oh. Guys, was I off center again? Oh, for fuck's sake. Okay, well, I'm sorry. Let me, let me fix this. I don't know why. Let's just go to share screen. There you go. You guys didn't, did you, okay, let's, let me show you some pictures then. You guys got to at least hear the video, which is the part that counts. Um, oh, thanks for shouting out chaotic gear. I appreciate it. Guys, um, shoot. Uh, hang on. I don't think my shout out works on here. Let's go do the shout out here. I'll, I'll do a shout out. Chaotic Good Mage, um, is part of Team RD and he is, he's actually the, the only other person I've seen making coffee like a professional on stream, which is really cool. Um, and well, I mean, he did kind of ruin it one time where he added Jello. <laughs> I still think about that. I still think about that. Oh wow, are you working out? Holy my shit! Told me not to play with my food, but like, Wait, let me turn this up. What? <laughs> it's so much fun. What the heck are you doing? What are you throwing? Is that a bell pepper? So if you guys want to see a really buff man cook in the kitchen. Uh, apparently shirtless. No, that you had a shirt on because you know Twitch. Uh, if you want to see that, go check out Chaotic Good Mage. He also plays a variety of games, um, like Fortnite recently, and then also another game called Elder Scrolls Online, and many other things. Um, kind of like a variety streamer, but he is best known for his really cool food and cooking streams, which are really fun to watch. Jello coffee, yeah, he was making coffee Jello. Um, <laughs> and yeah, it was very funny because you were using the Chemex and you had made the coffee, um, you had put your grounds in the water, um, in the top of the Chemex, but then you put the jello gelatin powder into the top and there was like a filter and because it was solidifying so quickly, um, it could, the coffee wouldn't go through the filter. And so it was like a very long time. I don't actually know. Did you ever get enough coffee jello out of that Chemex? Um, <laughs> it took like an hour. <laughs> um, that's your Beck tank top? There's a Beck tank top? Were you cosplaying as Beck? You made durian frosted cupcakes. Wait, that sounds so okay. I'm actually, I have a love-hate relationship with durian. Um, durian, if you guys don't know, it smells like poop and tastes like onions. Some people really like it, though. I think our taste buds are just built differently. Um, how did the cupcakes turn out? Did they smell like poop and taste like onions? The move I made was calculated, but I'm bad at math. Oh, that's okay. You tried, though. <laughs> that is um, very cool. Anyways, um, uh, what were we doing? Let's see, let me go back to my share screen. Um, oh yeah, I wanted to quickly show you some of the uh, the genital regions of this, this insect after it gets fungi infecting it. I realize that sounds so bad. Um, let me just, oh, and the name, the name of the fungi that does this is called Massospora cicadina, cicidina. Um, that's a muscle fiber. We don't care about that. 
Um, let's see here. Ah, oh, look at this. Okay. So as you can see, you can tell right away that it's a fungus because it's very fuzzy and you can see all of the little powdery things. I cosplayed a oh, fake tattoo sleeve and everything. Oh, that is amazing. I didn't even see the tattoo. I assumed it was normal. Your durian cupcakes, cu cupcakes tasted wonderful. Okay. 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 Maybe with sugar in it, it tastes good. Sugar makes everything better. Um, so this is one of the male cicadas. And as you can see, the back end of it has been completely replaced with the fungal colonies. It's like a powdery. It is literally like a salt shaker. It looks kind of like a crayon. Um, <laughs> here's a whole bunch of them. This looks really messed up. They kind of look like, um, I actually didn't know cicadas were so big. It looks like um, fireflies. Um, this is misleading. It looks, the, the broken off branch looks just like the cicada's butt. Um, let's see, there's another close up, very powdery. That is awful, right? Imagine getting your genitals replaced with this. Like, first of all, I don't even know. Do, do insects feel pain? <laughs> Literally the first thing I looked up. <laughs> do insects feel pain? Over 15 years ago, researchers found that insects and fruit flies in particular feel something akin to acute pain called nociception. When they encounter extreme heat, cold, or physically harmful stimuli, they react, much in the same way humans react to pain. Whoa. But can they feel their genitals being removed? That's what I want to know. Do bugs feel fa pain? Um, blah, blah, blah. Researchers from the University of Sydney in Australia say the discovery, whoop discovery. Oh, a study that shows that not only do insects feel pain from an injury, but they suffer from chronic pain after recovering from one. People do not really think of insects as feeling any kind of pain, blah, blah, blah. So in non-humans, okay, but it's already shown that in lots of different invertebrate animals, they can sense and avoid dangerous stimuli that we perceive as painful. In non-humans, we call this sense nociception, the sense that detects potentially harmful stimuli like heat, cold, or physical injury. Um, so prior to the study, they knew that insects could sense some pain, but they didn't know that an injury, such as being infected by fungus maybe, could lead to long-lasting hypersensitivity. Um, it would be very interesting, though, if the fungus kind of um, released some sort of, um, I don't know, chemical signal that maybe blunted the nociceptor, uh, nociception receptors, is that correct, <laughs> in the insects, because then they wouldn't feel the pain if, if that receptor was blocked. You have leftover cupcakes? Chaotic, oh my god. I don't know. Do you want to do a trade? Do you want to do, do you want to do a trade? I send you coffee and you send me cupcakes. They probably wouldn't last in the mail though. <laughs> but one day, actually, well, I'm not going to if you I was like, "Can you send me the recipe?" but I'm never going to bake. <laughs> because I I don't cook at all. Um I made coffee jelly. I'm still on that. Wait, you made coffee jelly? Did you make it for like some sort of um I don't know, like drink, or do you just eat the coffee jelly plain? Um, I love coffee jelly, obviously. It's delicious. I like to get it in my boba drinks. Um, I also like it with the milk pudding and the coffee jelly in like a milky boba. It's really good. Um, insects can move away from harmful stimuli, stimuli, which makes them smarter than some people I know. Are we talking about me here? No, just kidding. Uh, it's always funny, like, I always think it's hilarious when people, like, stick their finger in fire just to see if it hurts, um, or to see how long they can stick it in the fire until it hurts. That's always hilarious to me. Um, I made it like a dessert. Ooh, that sounds good. Um, so you just had, like, chunks of coffee jello, and you just, like, eat it? There are... Calf, do you not know how to cook? This is a great question. Um, I don't. 
Okay, so let me preface. I can cook if required of me. Um, I used to cook a lot of cheesecake, and I can make very good cheesecake, although that's technically not cooking, that's baking. Um, when I cooked in college, I would make meals that involved basically cracking eggs in a bowl and then microwaving it. Um, and then what's really cool is if you flip the bowl over, you have a little uh, solid egg mass that resembles a small jello mold and you can just scoop out the egg. It actually doesn't come out of the bowl unless you butter it, but it was real, yeah, real interesting. Um, sometimes I poured cans of tomato soup on top of this weird egg mold and then I would eat it. Um, and then one time I tried to make pho um, from Trader Joe's ingredients only, but I didn't buy actual real fish. I bought sardines and stuck them into my, my pho and it was awful. It was such a mistake. It was horrible. It was traumatic. I had to throw it away. And then one time I had made a bunch of lentil soup. Um, well, not really lentil soup. I just cooked the lentils in hot water. And I wanted to make, I had this idea that I could make lentil patty, like lentil pancakes. So I mixed in flour and eggs with the lentils and then I fried it in a frying pan and it tasted awful. <laughs> it was so disgusting. It was so disgusting. Oh my God. Um, the only time I knew how I actually cooked food that was edible was when I was subscribed to HelloFresh, which reminds me maybe, maybe I keep getting like these stream element things that are like, do you want to promote HelloFresh? And I'm like, oh man, I don't know. That means I have to cook again. Um, but I was cooking then and it was kind of fun. You know, if you just follow instructions, you can actually cook things, which is shocking to me. Um, but yeah, prior to that, I just really made weird shit in the kitchen. It was, it was an adventure all the time. Um, I, <laughs> we're going to have to teach you how to cook sometime. Okay, I know I make this sound bad, but I have made good things occasionally. It's like a, a diamond in the rough. When I make something good, I'm shocked. The world is shocked. Everyone I know is shook. They're like, wow, you can cook. It's incredible. Um, yeah. What is the worst thing? Oh, there was this one time my friend invited me over for her, to her house and all she asked me to do was to make garlic bread. And I was like, yeah, that's so easy. You take some sourdough or you take not sourdough. You take like that big baguette thing. You slice it in half and then you put like butter and garlic powder on top. So the thing is though, I didn't read um, and I grabbed garlic salt and I dumped garlic salt all over the baguette. So then I put it in the oven, still not realizing my grave error. And we took it out and um, I break off a piece of the bread and stick a gigantic piece in my mouth. And it's just freaking salt. It was awful. It was horrific. Um, we had to toss the bread. I think we just like scraped the salty stuff off. Uh, <laughs> experimenting is fun about cooking, yes. If you don't cook, what do you eat? Ah, this is great. Uh, a good question, actually. I like to eat um, ramen noodles. <laughs> I uh, know. Actually, uh, the people I live with, they, they cook a lot of extra food, and I just eat some of that and pay for it with my rent. I have found people to cook for me again. It is amazing. Um, and sometimes I actually only eat one meal a day because I don't like cooking. I don't eat breakfast, and I don't eat lunch. Um, I'll just pack like an apple, and I'll eat that for lunch. Um, and then if there's free food in my lab, I just eat that. But I don't actually, I like to um, just accidentally do the whole intermittent fasting. It's kind of fun. It's like a, um, not a hobby, but it's like a, it's a habit now. And so I do that and then I just eat dinner um, and I just eat whatever um, happens to be around. Um, yeah, it's fun. It's fun. Okay. Um, you're shocked. <laughs> 
I, I can, I mean, I can cook, I can cook noodles. Yes, actually, you know what's so sad? I overcook noodles all the time. Like, so what I have to do is to make al dente noodles is I take my ramen packet. Um, I actually did this right before stream. I take a ramen package. I break it in half. I stick the two halves into a gigantic mug. Then I take my hot water. over here, just my little teapot. And I just pour the hot water from my teapot on top of my noodles and eat it. It works really well. If I try to cook noodles in a um, like in an actual cook pot on the stove, I will always overcook them and ruin the noodles. <laughs> Should have said raw noodles. No, they're not raw. They're rehydrated. They're rehydrated noodles. Um, the other thing I like to do is I like to make smoothies. I like to make protein shakes because that doesn't require cooking. Um, I just take like a big scoop of protein powder and some bananas, some frozen pineapple or something, and I stick it in a blender. Sometimes I put almond butter into it, which is really nice, um, and I just blend it up. No, Graham, not noodle smoothies. <laughs> I've made some really weird things in a blender. Um, for example, uh, I used to do this thing all the time. I think it was actually good for me because I felt healthier. Um, but I would make kale smoothies. Um, I would just put like kale leaves and bananas and orange juice into a blender and blend that up and drink that. Um, like just raw kale, which was gross. I d it was kind of disgusting because like the kale leaves wouldn't get fully blended. So you'd have like chunks of kale um, and you'd have to chew it. I don't know if you've ever had a smoothie that you have to chew, but it's 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 a weird thing. I hope you never plan to move out or you might starve. <laughs> uh, it's OK. I'll just I'll just like buy food from a, a store or something and like, I don't know. Actually, my, my go-to is um, eating almond butter um, out of the container. Sometimes I make toast and I put the almond butter on the toast. That's always fun. Um, yeah, bread and almond butter. That's how I, that's how I get by. It's protein. It's protein. <laughs> oh God. Um, my mom used to make a really disgusting smoothie, though. As a kid, she would take uh, lettuce and apples, and she would put it into the blender and blend up this lettuce and apple mix. And it was watery, and it tasted nasty, and it had a lot of apple peel in it. It was so horrid. And she wouldn't let me leave the, until I leave the table until I drank it. It was like torture or something. Like, don't do that to your kids. If you ever have kids, don't make them drink blended apples and lettuce. It's torturous. Oh, man. I don't know. That was a tangent. Um, yeah, so I think what I'm going to do with the fungi thing, I think I will do a part two next weekend um, because there's so much more that we could go into and... Um, you know, talk about all the fun things that the fungi does in your brain and stuff. But I, I think, um, I think I've rattled on long enough. I think I, I've been doing this for like what two hours now. <laughs> We've had a lot of tangents though, which is fun. Um, I love tangents, and my mouth is dry again. 